Welcome to our session on Just Cause. Um, I'm Arthur Perlstein. I'm director of arbitration at FMCS. Uh, and I'm so glad that you all could be at the conference and, uh, and be with us here today. Uh, this is one of our spotlight sessions because we figured, turns out correctly, uh, that um, uh, this would be a very important issue for just about anybody and everybody at this conference. Um, so, uh, so we are on, on tape, but uh, behave just as you normally would. <coughs> uh, or in some cases, maybe not. Um, in any case, um, it, it, it's a great pleasure. I, I have managed to recruit, I pat myself on the back, uh, to recruit I think the best possible panel on this issue in the country. Four of the leading arbitrators in the country, uh, and, and not to mention four of the most knowledgeable people in labor relations in general. I'm gonna make very brief introductions rather than read through the entire thing because you can, you can do that yourselves. Um, but um, so I'm gonna start with uh, Margie Brogan, who is uh, sitting there merely um, because of the small fact that she is now the president of the National Academy of Arbitrators. Um, and um, it's a real delight to have her. Um, she has a bi-coastal practice, Philly and uh, uh, the Bay Area, um, in arbitration and mediation. Uh, she was once a f uh, field attorney at the NLRB. Um, she is on more permanent panels than I could possibly begin to start, so I'm not even gonna start. Um, she has uh, taught as an adjunct faculty, currently um, adjunct at, uh, at Berkeley, uh, at, at the law school, uh, teaching labor and employment arbitration. Um, second, uh, seated um, to her, uh, if you're looking this way, left, um, Dan Nielsen. Um, he is based right here in Chicago. He's a mediator and arbitrator. He's been a member of the National Academy for 25 years. Uh, he was at one point the director of uh, the University of Wisconsin uh, Parkside Labor and Industrial Relations uh, degree program. Um, and um, he also served on the faculty. Um, and he is a past president of the Association of Labor Relations Agencies, uh, better known as, uh, as ALRA. Um, and um, seated closest to me, um, just because we, we didn't want to just get the president of the NAA, we also wanted to get the vice president, uh, is Laura Cooper. Um, and um, Laura is a professor uh, a chaired professor at the University of Minnesota uh, Law School, um, and as I say, current VP of the NAA. Uh, she teaches and practices arbitration and other, AD, uh, other ADR procedures, um, and um, you know, with particular attention uh, to the world of the workplace. Uh, she has done absolutely groundbreaking research into the question of What's, hap what's actually happening out there with um, decisions and arguments about just cause, uh, and uh, has co-authored a book about it uh, um, uh, called, um, it's got a great title, um, More Than We Have Ever Known About Discipline in, and Discharge in Labor Arbitration. And then there's the colon, an empirical study. So it's not just, um, you know, it's not just fun and games. Last, but most certainly not least, is Floyd Weatherspoon. Um, Floyd um, is um, a, a professor, or he's professor emeritus, um, professor for many years at uh, Capital University School of Law. He's a mediator, arbitrator, and fact finder. Um, he, both in labor and employment and in commercial cases, um, he's a former associate dean um, uh, of ADR programs at that law school. Uh, he's uh, a member of the National Academy, um, and um, his newest publication is just out, or is it, is it out already now? 
Uh, and the flyers for it is outside. Okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, well it, done, it, boy. It's, uh, With all the just it, cause it, it, analysis. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's called um, Labor and Employment Arbitration Leading Cases and Decisions A Practical Approach to the Study of Arbitration. So uh, it's something you really should get your hands on. Um, and um, I've had uh, the pleasure of working with each and every one of these people in one capacity or another. Um, Floyd, um, in particular, has been one of our trainers in the Becoming a Labor Arbitrator course uh, that FMCS uh, provides. So it's really uh, a great honor and pleasure for us to have them here. Uh, and I don't think you will find people that will be able to tell you more uh, about the world of, uh, of just cause. So, uh, and the changing perspective. Now, we want to start off, have I got it upside down? Yes. Um, we want to start off just by, in case anybody needs any reminder, of the so-called seven tests of just cause uh, devised by Carol Daugherty, um, where a no to any of the questions that follow uh, normally signifies that, that there wasn't just cause. And so um, I will uh, read them aloud as you, uh, as you can follow them. I'll read it quickly. Uh, one, did the company give to the employee forewarning or foreknowledge of the possible or probable disciplinary consequences of the employee's conduct? Two, was the company's rule or managerial order reasonably related to A, the orderly, efficient, and safe operation of the company's business, and B, the performance that the company might properly expect of the employee? Whoops, I don't know what happened there. Um, let me make it big again. Aha, made it big again. That's how good I am. Um, three, um, uh, four, uh, was the um, three, did the company before administering discipline to an employee make an effort to discover whether the employee did in fact violate or disobey a rule or order of management? Four, was the company's investigation conducted fairly and objectively? Five, at the investigation, did the judge, quote unquote, obtain substantial evidence or proof that the employee was guilty as charged. Six, has the company applied its rules, orders, and penalties even-handedly and without discrimination to all employees? And seven, last but not least, was the degree of discipline administered by the company in a particular case reasonably related to A, the seriousness of the employee's proven offense, and B, the record of the employee in his service with the company. Um, as many of you may know, uh, not everybody agrees uh, uh, on the application of these seven tests. Um, but we're, and, and so we're going to have some lively conversation here because among the people who disagree uh, are actually right here. And so we're going to kick it off um, with uh, one of the leading proponents of just cause in the United States, Professor Floyd Weatherspoon. All right, thank you for those, uh, those uh, uh, comments. Uh, it is such a privilege to be here today and to be on the stage uh, with my fellow Academy members. And I've already asked for apology, I mean, uh, to apologize, the forgiveness, if you will, uh, because they're going to learn or see that I totally disagree uh, with some of the things that I know that they're going to say uh, here today. <laughs> and so, you know, my role here today really is to defend, you know, this, this test. That, you know, it's ironically that, you know, we're in Chicago, and as you know, the birth of this, of this test was born here. So it's kind of ironic that, you know, 50 years later that uh, we're here today and I'm here trying to defend uh, its particular uh, use. And so as I was looking over my notes and I said, wow, you know, 50 years and uh, it all started uh, here. So what, what I plan to do in this short time that I have, and then I'm sure we're going to have some dialogue, uh, is to kind of set the stage with regards to why uh, I think that the seven test is intact uh, and we should not make any adjustments uh, to it. And so 
Starting out, I'm going to give some very basic practical reasons uh, about why we should maintain it and also kind of address uh, some of the criticism that I can anticipate uh, that will come shortly. And at the top of my list, and I know you've heard this cliche many times before, if it ain't broke, why are we trying to break it and then fix it again? Because it seems to me that it's not broke. And so why is, why is there a need for us to try to change uh, this particular system that's in place and it appears uh, to be working? Uh, and let me tell you some reasons why you know, it, is, it is working. It, it seems to me uh, that it is a test that ensures that, that balance of interest uh, among all the parties. And so it's, it's not you know, lopsided one way or the other. I think when he was designing this particular test that he had in mind in terms of how to ensure the interests of the employer is met, as well as that grievant uh, who's out there filing a particular, a, particular, a particular complaint. And so that balance of, of interest is there. You know, if, if you change the system, the question becomes, what system would you put in place to ensure that balance of interest uh, is there? So I have at the top of my list, is working. The balance of interest uh, is there and is being maintained. So why should we change it, you know, at this particular uh, point? You know, the other one uh, that I have on this list, and I'll wait to kind of see, they may change my mind, but I kind of doubt it, is that I don't think there's any other a definitive model that has been put in place at this particular junction. And so if you take it back, so I assume that someone's going to come forward and say, well, this is the new test that we should follow at this particular point in time. And I haven't seen anyone come forward with a definitive model where there's no imperfections. Clearly in this particular model that we have now, there are some places that we need to massage. Uh, you know, there are a few minor imperfections. But if we put a new system in place, the question is, uh, would it be totally without any uh, imperfections at all? And I haven't actually seen that. And maybe we'll hear that today in terms of why we should throw this one out. Uh, and replace it uh, with, with something else. So I'm kind of waiting on that particular uh, discussion. Uh, there's been a lot of criticisms with regards to this particular model, and I had a whole shopping list uh, that I you know, kind of researched and saw arguments from the union and arguments from, from management and arguments from arbitrators with regards to criticizing uh, this particular model. And I just picked out a few, and then I'm going to address some of those criticisms that, you know, that I've uh, read about. Uh, one deals with mitigating and extenuating circumstances uh, is missing from the model. And, and so when I, when I read some of the criticisms from the union side, they said, well, you know, that piece is not there. You know, it really should be in the model. It's built out. Uh, but as an arbitrator, it seems to me that it actually is there. Uh, it's at step seven. And so even though we don't actually say those words uh, that the criticism that I hear, let me say that language again, is that mitigating, extenuating circumstances is missing from the model. But it is in the model, and I think that it's at step seven and arbitrators apply it all the time. You know, the other one that I hear quite a bit is that the investigation test is just not realistic. Is that whatever investigation you come up with, that if it, if it uh, appears that you did it late, that's still not going to change the outcome if, in fact, you prove that the person has violated whatever policy that it is. And so therefore, take that model, that step out of the test, where it seems to me that you, you want to ensure that there is an investigation. Uh, and there may be times when, in fact, the investigation might come late. Uh, and the question then becomes, what do we do in that situation if, in fact, it's shown that the person violated the policy? Well, it really depends. It, it seems to me that you have selected arbitrators based upon their knowledge, their judgment, with some discretion, uh, that they'll be able to balance that out. And so I don't think there's a need to take out that particular step in the process. But I, you know, I see that criticism that's, that's on the list. Uh, you know, the other one that I, I read is that it's, this test is misleading in substance and distracting. And I think what's being said there, I, I saw that one in a number of places, is that as arbitrators, we force folks into addressing these seven tests when, in fact, they may not be relevant at all. Well, as, as an arbitrator, it's not, and I'm sure my colleagues as well, I'm sure that if the parties, you, have not suggested that there's an issue with one of the elements here, we're not going to force you to give us a, a long dissertation on one of those elements that's not relevant. You know, I find myself often saying 
The parties have suggested there's only one test that's at issue here, and therefore I'm not going to address the other six. Uh, but when you read the criticism, it's, it's as though, as arbitrators, we're forcing you to articulate some arguments or defenses with regards to all seven, uh, when in fact all seven of them may not necessarily apply. It may be one, it may be number three, it may be number four. Uh, and so I can see people criticizing it if in fact we distract you into writing about something that's not relevant at all. But in real practice, I don't think as arbitrators we force you to write about some aspect of one of the tests that the parties have clearly said, there's not a notice issue here, Mr. Arbitrator. And so therefore we were not going to discuss that particular element even though it might be number one. We move on to the ones that we find are, are most, most relevant, you know, that's, that's there. And I just noticed that, uh, Art, I thought I had a little time there, but I'm still at zero, so I've just got started. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are in trouble. <laughs> kind of tell me where I'm at along the way here, Art, so I can be sure. Um, there's some other criticism, but I'm going to save those and come back to them in, in just a moment. Uh, there's some responses uh, that I want to make with regards to uh, some of the criticism. Um, and one of the criticisms that I see in the writings uh, about this topic is that arbitrators need more discretion uh, with regards to writing their awards. And I totally disagree. It seems to me that our authority should be very narrow. Uh, and those seven elements there, a test, forces us to walk down a particular format. Uh, that we should not be making a lot of deviations along the way. Uh, if you take away that test, that might mean that as arbitrators that you've given them so much discretion that it's going to be difficult to be able to determine, you know, what the outcome is going to be. You know with this test, uh, if you adopt it and you follow it, and, you, and your expectation is that the arbitrator is going to follow it uh, as, as well, then it's fairly narrow. We don't want to give arbitrators more discretion because the more discretion you give them with regards to analyzing cases, then what might happen uh, is that their own brand of justice, you know that term, may come in uh, because they have so much discretion with regards to what the outcome is going to be. And so this particular test, I think, forces uh, the arbitrator to stay on task you know, with regards to these particular elements. Some other reasons why I think, uh, and I'm jumping around in my notes a little bit just to ensure that we have time for debate and discussion. Uh, there's some other reasons why I think it's important. Uh, I think it's important also because in maintaining it because as the parties, you know what the test is going to be and what's going to be followed if you are still following this particular model. Uh, it seems to me from the employer's perspective uh, that you would want this particular system because as you take disciplinary action against employees, then you can anticipate what responses that you must give if this is a case that goes to arbitration. It's no secret. And so therefore, if you're going to terminate an employee, I'm sure the labor relations person is going to say, well, you know if this goes to arbitration, we've got these seven, seven elements here, and we've covered notice uh, and all the other elements. You know, with regards to the union, uh, it seems to me that you would want it to stay in place as well. Because as you make decisions with regards to whether you're going to take a case to arbitration, you want to be able to tell that grievant, okay, we got an issue with regards to this step and this step, and these are going to be factors that an arbitrator is going to consider in making a decision. And so that means that the parties understand the system. There's a roadmap, uh, and we're all following that particular roadmap to the ultimate award. If we allow arbitrators to have more discretion and to throw out, if you will, parts of this particular test or all of it, then the question becomes, as you make decisions about from the employer's perspective, is this a case that we feel we could win you know, if we terminated this person if they go to arbitration? And at the same time, the union on the other side, you will also be asking the question, well, if I get an arbitrator that's not following the seventh test here, now what, what, what are they following? And what are the factors that we should consider in terms of taking this case uh, to, to arbitration? So clearly, to me, to me, there's an advantage in terms of keeping it uh, uh, in place. Um, the predictability is there. Uh, it seems to me, as the arbitrator, it, of course, I hear different opinions, but it seems to me that it should be no, no surprise when you get an award. When you get my award, it should not be a surprise. When you get theirs, if they're following the seven steps, it shouldn't be a surprise to you either. Because in this system, the predictability is there. 
you should be able to say, okay, this is the test, this person is gonna work through this test, and based upon these particular facts, this is the outcome that I, in fact, can predict. And it seems to me that you want that predictability. If you take back, if you will, this particular test and, and allow uh, arbitrators to be able to almost at a whim uh, say what, what the test is going to be, it seems to me that the predictability is going to be you know, at issue there. And I have some other points, but I'm going to save them. But I will make this last point as I kind of turn it over, and then we'll see what the additional comments is going to be. And, and my last note at the very bottom, it, it does say, with all due respect to my colleagues, I think they still are using the seven tests along the way. Because when you look at arbitrators who don't spell it out as the seven tests, and you look at their elements, I see they're all hid in there somewhere. Uh, and they pull them out when they want to use them to be able to support their particular decision. So in reality, I think they're there. They're just hid, and we've, we've kind of reconfigurated them, maybe called them something else, but they're actually there and they're hid uh, uh, in that particular analysis. And, I, and then I guess the other uh, point, uh, as Laura's gonna discuss, uh, the particular research on this. And as you know with research, it's always about the question that's being asked. And so if I should ask you, or you ask an arbitrator whether you're using you know, those seven tests there, uh, folks might say, well, you know, no, we're not. Well, and that could be true. I don't always use all seven elements either. But if they ask me, are you using some of those elements when they're appropriate, and the parties have said it's an issue, then my response would have to be, Yes. And then the last point, as I was preparing to come in, I ran into uh, another uh, well-established uh, uh, National Academy arbitrator, and I said, they asked me, uh, what am I speaking on? I said, well, I'm here to defend just cause, and I won't say who the person is because I see them in the audience. And they said to me, well, Floyd, we got to defend this because, think about it, our format's in place, uh, you know, it, it's been there forever. Uh, and, you know, I thought about it, I said, okay, I got all these reasons here, but that might mean I got to change my format, you know, I've just, I just got word down. And so when, you, so when you read my decision, and I thought about this the other day, I said, God, this is really boring. You know, I start out with here's the seven tests and here's the elements we're going to apply. So I spell that out in every case, so it is kind of boring. But the format is there. And so if, if we change this, guys, uh, that also means I got to learn the system to, to make some changes, and so do you. All right, we turn it and over. And that's the best reason. <laughs> that's the best reason. <laughs> All right. Well, Floyd, thank you for that very compelling case. Um, and um, I don't think uh, I could have found anyone better uh, to, to advocate uh, for the seven tests. Um, now we're going to change the format just a little bit. Um, and we're going to have a conversation between Margie and Dan, um, sort of um, uh, a give and take. Um, and and I, I, I promised Floyd that I would reserve time for rebuttal um, uh, at some point. No, but um, no. <laughs> I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to, uh, to Margie and Dan. Okay. Well, uh, this will be a little bit of a conversation between the two of us and a little bit of a speech and uh, a little bit of uh, whatever else comes up. Uh, I mean, I would have to start out by saying that I completely agree with Floyd that a party should never be shocked by an arbitration award. That's the job of the bill, okay? <laughs> the award should not be the thing that shocks you. <laughs> the, uh, the seven tests uh, have appeal, intellectually they have appeal, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, they, they give a sense of predictability to what is otherwise a subjective process, all right? Um, they, give the uh, framework to the parties and to the arbitrator for litigating, arguing, and analyzing the case. It's easy to follow. There are seven steps. I mean, if you can count to seven, you should be able to put something in following the seven steps, all right? Um, 
It also gives the arbitrator some relief from the uh, problem of being the great and powerful Oz. Um, you know, I, I tell people I'm an arbitrator. And after I explain it to them three or four times, uh, they will say, oh, that must be a great job. You get to do whatever you want. And I explain to them that, uh, no, that's not really true. Uh, you know, I spend a fair percentage of my time doing things that I think are wrong, or at least stupid, um, or unfair, or distasteful, because that's what the rules of the road require me to do in a given case. Okay? I don't get to do what I want. But if I have seven tests, um, I'm relieved of the problem of it being my decision to do something stupid. If I have seven tests, I can just walk through those seven tests, and at the end of it, don't blame me. Carol Doherty did this to you. <laughs> you know? Find Carol Doherty's descendants and yell at them, um, because I'm just following seven tests, and what the heck, they're tests. You know, it's not like they're principles, they're tests. I have no choice. Uh, so that's the appeal of, of the seven tests. The, um, the problem I have with seven tests is they don't make any sense. Um, and they create huge problems if you take them seriously. Uh, and the reason for that is that, that, anyone in here familiar with railroad labor relations? A few people, okay. Carol Doherty was a brilliant scholar and a brilliant practitioner uh, and his start as an arbitrator was as a referee in the railroads. All right. Now, railroad labor relations is utterly different than labor relations in most of the private sector. And particularly the discipline arbitration process is utterly different. If you have a case in the railroads, someone is accused of misconduct, charges are brought, all right, and an investigation is convened. And in the investigation, you have a hearing officer who is appointed by the carrier, and you have um, someone representing the carrier who prosecutes the case, and you have the organization comes in and defends uh, the uh, claimant. And that process goes on. At the end, the hearing officer makes a decision. Uh, and for our purposes, we'll assume that the hearing officer has decided to sustain the discipline, uh, discharge the employee, because otherwise you haven't got a case to argue about. Um, that goes then, if they want to appeal it, to a public law board. The public law board is headed by a referee, who's the neutral, the arbitrator, the analog of the arbitrator. But a public law board in the railroads doesn't conduct an evidentiary hearing. All right? It doesn't hear witnesses. It doesn't take any evidence. It reviews the record that was generated below at the investigation. All right? They don't judge credibility. They're bound to accept the credibility judgments made below unless they're wildly, obviously wrong. All right? That's a very different function than the function of an arbitrator in a typical just cause case. But if you look at the railroad system, as being an appellate system, then the seven questions make some sense. Uh, the seven questions, you know, for example, uh, this one's always struck me as sort of ridiculous. Uh, was the company's investigation conducted fairly and objectively? Okay, I mean, it'd be nice if it was, but in a hearing that I'm conducting on a regular just cause case, that's not a big, big deal. I mean, they either have the evidence or they don't have the evidence. They either make their case or they don't make their case. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter to me if they were really happy when they fired the person or really sad when they fired the person. It's a question of whether they proved to me that the person should have been fired. Um, but if you're looking at a railroad investigation where investigation has a very specific meaning, okay, it's not an investigation like you would run as a company. It's an investigation referring to a formal hearing process. Then the fairness and adequacy of the investigation, uh, the neutrality of the investigation, is very, very important. That's a question that you have to ask yourself in a railroad hearing. 
It's a question that means nothing in most just cause cases. Um, the same thing with did the judge obtain substantial evidence or proof that the employee was guilty as charged? I've seen people bend themselves into pretzels trying to prove that there was someone who was a sort of a judge making a decision in this discharge case, you know, when you've got a small operation and you just barely got a personnel manager, and they've, they've got to point to someone who was the judge who had adequate, that's not the way it works, okay? That is the way it works if you have a formal hearing process and you're sitting in an appellate uh, capacity. So the, the problem is that this was all written and phrased for railroad appeal work, all right? And that phrasing is just repeated by rote in other contexts, that is, private sector, uh, uh, well, private and public sector, just cause hearings, uh, where the word don't even have the same meaning, okay? The word investigation means something completely different, but it's just repeated over and over again. And thus you have cases that are litigated in the convoluted uh, manner trying to prove things that aren't really in dispute. And I would have to disagree that uh, there's any frequency to people saying, oh, well, we're not going to um, uh, talk about these four because they're agreed. Why would you give up those four if you're the union? You know, you're gonna say they didn't prove this one, this one, and this one. Uh, they didn't prove them because they weren't in dispute. All right. Um, anyway, I've um, stepped all over uh, oh, no. Marty's mm -hmm. uh, portion here. I would say, listening to these two gentlemen, that what we have here is a failure to communicate. <laughs> <laughs> because I think if you look at the elements, and I would call them elements, of just cause, yes, we, this is what I would ask all of you when you prepare a case take a look at these issues. Are they in your case? Can you argue them for your point of view? When you're, before you make an employment decision, look at these factors. Look at the employee's discipline record. Look at the, the proof of the, of, the, of the rule, a violation of the rule. Has the rule been publicized? Do people know about it? How have other people been treated under the rule? Yes, those are all the factors that you should be looking at. But Doherty's tests say that an answer no to any one of the seven questions equals no just cause. And I, I, I heard twice earlier that this was the defense of just cause. No, it is a definition of just cause that you'll see with Laura's research is not the common law, quote unquote, of what arbitrators do. It is one definition. It is not the definition that most arbitrators use. And yet you do see it in court cases. In my state of Pennsylvania, the courts have used it. And there's a lot, I've seen agencies put it in their documents of training. And what happens is it leads to confusion with folks, instead of seeing these as factors to rely upon and to argue in your briefs, you feel your need to take your brief and turn it into the seven questions and go back and forth between the facts. Let me tell you, as an arbitrator, there's no harder brief in the world to read. So don't do that, okay? I'm if, just the opposite, but go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that for me, please. <laughs> you can do it for Floyd. But what I'm saying is that if I impose the seven tests, with Floyd, you know what you're getting. He's, he's prominent, he's well known, he's published. He, everybody knows he applies the seven tests, you know what you're getting. Mm -hmm. If I out of the blue impose the seven tests and you didn't argue to me lack of investigation, and all of a sudden that's what I rely upon in my decision, what do you get? A surprise, mm -hmm. the very thing that Floyd is saying no to. So again, this comes back to you should know your arbitrators. You should know how to select them, talk to each other. You know how your arbitrator writes. But just cause is a concept that was created by the parties. They can choose in their collective bargaining agreement to put the seven tests in or some of the seven tests in. And many CBAs do. But it is not my job to impose all of them. And and again, I, I want to make it clear, it doesn't mean that I, I disagree with, 
Floyd that any one of these things are lacking in importance, and I guess I disagree with Dan a little bit. Due process in the workplace is extremely important. An employer should ask the employee, you know, his side of the story. When I hear that, that they did it, bing, goes off in my head. And I'm going to listen very carefully. But if Laura is the union counsel and she doesn't argue that point, then I feel as an arbitrator it's my job to confine my inquiry to the arguments of the parties. Mm -hmm. You folks are the people of the process, not me. You folks are the ones that I should listen to, I should respond to, I should answer your question. And I think when I take these seven questions and I impose them, that any single one of them is a no equals no just cause, then I'm not providing the service that you hired me for. And I have a, I have a suspicion that Floyd, you kind of use the seven tests like I do, uh, in a way. You're listening to the parties, you're seeing these as factors, you're answering their questions, but you're not doing what Docker did, Doherty did, which is exactly what Dan just explained, because that was coming out of an appellate system. So I could say more, but that's my point. Well, just I'm just trying to bring you all together. You know, uh, that's my I'm job. Yeah, and that's exactly what I fear because <laughs> it's much more fun. Uh, <laughs> Floyd, would you like to make a few comments in response to uh, well, what I guess folks uh, have said? Uh, the point with uh, Margie is that uh, I, if, if you don't raise the issues of, of one of those tests, I am not going to raise that issue for you. Uh, even if there, I could see that it could be an argument. I am not going to raise an argument for you because I don't represent the client. Uh, I'm the neutral person there. But I disagree with Dan with regards to uh, the union saying uh, that you know uh, element three or four is not an issue. Uh, you know, like all of us, we write a lot of cases, but I don't. I don't have cases where all I had to address all seven elements. <coughs> I can't, I'm sitting here trying to think whenever I had one like that. You know, most of the time, uh, it's going to be element seven. And that's where I, just about every case is, is all about the record, mitigating factors, is it punitive in nature, uh, 32 years and they got fired. Yes, they did whatever they said they did. Uh, but we're not going to argue the issue that they didn't do it. Okay, yeah, they did do it. So I don't, we don't have to work that issue. Uh, but I'm left with element seven. So it's rare that I have all seven that, you know, that I have to address or the parties raise. Um, and, but I'm not, uh, then I disagree with Marjorie in the sense that I am not going to discuss any t test that you didn't put on the table. One of the parties have to put it on the table for me to be able to address. But I guess what I'm still lost with, uh, I guess from both Dan and Margie, is that if we take this test out, Okay, what is it that we want the parties to, to do in terms of uh, their position that they're going to take, or, or what, I guess a better way to say it, what tests are we going to use if we don't use these? I think we'd probably use the test that's been used in 80% of the cases or more for 50 years. Uh, you know, did, did the employee do it? Did the employee know that it was wrong? Uh, What's the employee's record? Uh, you know, the, all of the various factors that are applied in a just cause analysis. And most of them are addressed to one extent or another in these seven questions. Yeah. And I don't have as big a problem with the Doherty stuff uh, when people characterize it as the seven questions, all right? But that's not the way it's usually characterized. It's characterized as seven tests. And if you know, if it's a test, you can flunk it. And that's why in a lot of cases, we had different experiences, but people will not skip over one of these questions because why would they, you know? The other side might flunk it. Uh, you know, just as a matter of zealously representing the client, you want to put the other side to its proof and the other side wanting to meet that challenge will bend itself, as I said, into a pretzel trying to prove that there was a judge somewhere. Um, and if I may say, I see mine is just the opposite, is that uh, particular from, well, either side, is that if you know that there's, that you, 
no argument with regards to one of the elements. There's times when people have said to me, so, you know, Mr. Arbitrator, you can clearly see that, you know, that this is a problem right here. We're not going to come in here and insult you by trying to make an argument when we know, in fact, that there's an issue. But we do have an issue with regards to this other element because they know with the test, if you flunk one, uh, then you, you win. So why spend all this time trying to in, insult my intelligence with regards to one of the elements? And, they, and oftentimes the parties tell me that. We're not going to spend no time over here. The, the argument is over here. But the other thing, Dan, I think I heard you your say. Your clients re wait, respect wait, you more than I do. But, but let me make this and one point. you guys point. can't do all just, the just one point, Margie, <laughs> is that you listen to Dan, and I asked him what, what, the, what was the test? Did you hear him say that some of the tests is hid uh, in some of the other, those few elements that are there? So, see, I think they're hid. Uh, they just don't work on one, two, three. They're hid. I just wanted to say that I just heard Floyd say, if you flunk one, you lose. See, and that's the point. It, it isn't necessarily mean that if you, quote, unquote, whatever that flunk means, that you lose as the employer because it may be taken care of in remedy. What's the biggest one? The failure to ask the employee if he did it or not. Example, an employee walks up to their supervisor and says, I'm going to kill you, and I got a gun to do it. Mm -hmm. And on the spot, he's fired. Now, did the independent investigator have a hearing to see whether or not he said it? No. But then they come to me in arbitration, and we review the demeanor of the two witnesses, the circumstances. Maybe he said something really horrible to me first, maybe something even huger, all right? Really huge, you know, something really big. <laughs> it was terrific. That was amazing. Um, There's to be no politics in I, this I'm, I wasn't doing that. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> So, Floyd, do you... Do you but, but let me just say, but then if I conclude that this person, me, really did make that threat, um, there may be, you know, there's the, there's the just cause. But if I conclude that it was provoked, then it can be resolved perhaps in remedy and perhaps not. So, you know, the, the flunking of the test doesn't necessarily lead to the conclusion in my view, that there is no just cause. You, you come to me, let's hear the story, de novo, not appellate. Floyd, that begs I think he wanted to Dan, ask, well, I just, ask it first. I just wanted to mention that what Margie just, the example Margie just gave, is exactly what happened in the case that established the seven tests, which is Grief Brothers Cooperage, which That's is right. a Chicago firm. And in Grief Brothers Cooperage, the foreman saw the employee doing bad workmanship, ruining barrels, uh, then saw the employee kick and damage a barrel, uh, whereupon he confronted the employee and the employee was fired. Mm -hmm. All right. Carol Doherty reinstated because he found an inadequate investigation. That foreman has to be asking himself, what kind of an investigation was he supposed to do? You know, ask himself questions, you know, vigorously cross-examine himself, you know, test his own credibility. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And yet Doherty was captured by his own iteration of this test. I'm sorry, go ahead. All right. You know, as I suggested earlier, as I pointed out, is that one of the criticism is about this investigation, and I knew it was coming. Uh, and as I, as I pointed out, is that we hire arbitrators based on their knowledge and expertise and their judgment. And so therefore, in a scenario like this, is, is that I wouldn't automatically say, okay, you failed because we didn't stop at that moment to do an investigation, that this might be an unusual situation, it might be an anomaly. The question is, okay, how short of a time after that did you do the investigation to collect the data? Maybe based on those circumstances, we couldn't do it at that moment. Uh, but shortly thereafter, we did an investigation and we captured that information. And there's a legitimate reason why we couldn't do it at that moment because of a safety issue. It seems, see, that's the place where we give arbitrators some discretion, not a lot, uh, you know, with regards to how we work through those particular issues. So I wouldn't automatically say, okay, you didn't bring in an investigation before you sent him home. The question is, did you do an investigation and was there a reason why uh, you didn't do it at that moment prior to the termination? Uh, that would be my response to, to that particular question. 
So it sounds like you're, and not, you're, quite as, there. you're not quite as evangelical about the seven tests. You're, you're a little bit of a reformed church of the seven. seven <laughs> that, I hadn't thought of it in those, in those terms. He goes with six and a half tests. You know. <laughs> okay, well, um, we're going to have more discussion and, 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 and are going to invite all kinds of questions and comments from you folks. Um, but uh, at this point, um, uh, Professor Rohr, Laura Cooper is going to present some of her research findings, um, which uh, are somewhat eye-opening as to, well, what's, what's actually happening? Good afternoon. Um, uh, before I go into the data, uh, I want to answer Floyd's question about, does anybody have a better test? Um, and I think there is one that's very well articulated. Um, and it's from Professors uh, Abrams and, and Nolan, who are uh, also a Academy members. Um, this slide yeah, gives just a, a brief there. outline of the structure of their test. Uh, but if you look in your materials that are um, on the website or in your app, you'll find uh, more detail. Another thing that you'll find in those materials is reference to an article uh, by John Dunsford uh, on the website of the National Academy of Arbitrators. That's a very uh, nice, uh, articulate uh, critique of, of the seven tests. Um, I just uh, mentioned to you that that website of the National Academy of Arbitrators um, uh, has loads of uh, materials, including all of the back presentations from the many years of annual meetings of the Academy, and those are available free on that website, so I encourage you to uh, take a look at it. Uh, now, Arthur has said, um, that my task is to talk about not uh, what arbitrators should do, but rather what arbitrators do do. Um, my colleagues, uh, Mario Bagnano and uh, Stephen Buffett, uh, worked together with me over a decade um, to try to analyze the largest database, and we think the most representative database of discipline and discharge decisions that exists anywhere uh, in the United States. As advocates, you know that most arbitration decisions are not published. And so to give an accurate picture of what arbitrators do, we needed to find a database that had both published and the very large number of unpublished awards. Um, we found that database uh, with over 2,000 decisions in discipline and discharge cases. Um, uh, and we analyzed them on over 100 variables. Uh, the product of that research is the book that Arthur mentioned, more than we've ever known about discipline and discharge in labor arbitration and empirical study. And uh, at the back of the room near the, uh, the candy and the water, um, there are some flyers that, explain, that have a little bit more detail on the book. But if you're interested, in, and if those flyers are gone, if you just put Laura J. Cooper in Amazon, uh, you will get more information about that book. Um, the book has over 300 pages and over 130 uh, graphs um, and tables, uh, but today I just want to focus on what we looked at with regard to the seven tests of, of uh, just cause. I should say also that we're uh, grateful to the Research and Education Foundation of the National Academy of Arbitrators who provided funding uh, for the study. Um, with regard to the seven tests of just cause, as far as we know, there has never previously been an empirical study of the extent to which arbitrators rely on the seven tests of just cause. Um, so here's, uh, oh, I should say uh, further, that uh, in the tables that follow, I have rounded up numbers from those that are in the book just for ease in, in seeing them on the screen but they're in the, the book with uh, up to two decimal uh, places. Uh, you'll also find because of the rounding that sometimes they're going to add up to more or less than 100% uh, on these slides. So um, here's the, the kind of bottom line about what we found with the use of the seven tests. Um, we found uh, that in less than 10% of the cases in examining the arbitrator's awards, the arbitrator referenced the seven tests in that format uh, that, uh, that Floyd has uh, described. Um, we did not have access, as you might imagine, to over 2,000 full files of labor arbitration cases. We had access to awards. 
So um, we were coding whether the arbitrator used the structure of the seven tests. It is certainly true, as Margie and Dan have said, that arbitrators use the elements of the seven tests. There were certainly cases in which unequal treatment or lack of progressive discipline or good work record um, was, uh, was relevant and was cited by the arbitrator. Just a footnote to good work record, um, you will find uh, in our research that employees with more than 10 years of service were less likely to get their jobs back than workers with uh, less uh, uh, seniority. So, um, so we, there were a number of ways in which the data uh, was not consistent with what we might call the conventional wisdom of labor arbitration. Uh, but with uh, specifically uh, here, uh, I said that, that fewer than 10% of arbitrators cited the seven tests. Um, that was true in our over 2,000 awards, but we found a very funny thing in our database. There was one single arbitrator out of our 81 arbitrators um, who issued 90 decisions and he used the seven tests, he or she, I don't actually know who that is, um, more than half of the time. So that one, very, one arbitrator in the database issued 28% of all awards using the seven tests. So to make the, the data make sense and not be distorted by the work of that one arbitrator, the rest of the numbers that I'm going to show you are the decisions of 80 arbitrators, the 1965 awards. Um, so the first thing that we see here is that the seven test has enormous salience. It's used in training. You see it mentioned in the literature. There are whole books about the seven test. In fact, arbitrators uh, who use it in that structure are a minority of all arbitrators. Well, what about advocates? Is it that the advocates are arguing the seven tests and then the arbitrators are ignoring it? Um, because we were working from awards in the absence of transcripts and files, our information about what advocates did came from the arbitration awards. And arbitrators always put in their awards, uh, the union argued this, the employer argued this, and that was the source of whether we thought that the tests had been argued by a union or management advocate. Um, as a result, we're probably to some extent undercounting the number of times that advocates use the seven tests because it may well be that an advocate used them and the arbitrator ignored it entirely. I guess further evidence that arbitrators um, were not interested in following that structure. But what we see here um, is that uh, both union advocates and employer advocates were reported to have used the seven tests uh, very uh, infrequently, and that in fact in 96% of cases, the full database of cases, the 2055 uh, cases, 96% of cases, neither party was referenced by the arbitrator as having used uh, the seven tests. I think the following slide is a very interesting one because it shows the correlation between advocates' use of the seven tests and arbitrators' use of the seven tests. Um, the first conclusion I would draw here is that arbitrators are far more likely to reference the seven tests if the parties do so. And so we found that in cases where one or both parties reference the seven tests, about a third of the arbitration awards reference the seven tests. And I think that's sort of consistent with what Margie said, is that arbitrators respond to the arguments that parties make, and if that's the party's rubric, some arbitrators will defer to that rubric. I think the other interesting number here, and perhaps the more interesting one, is that even in cases where parties referenced the seven tests, and we know they did because it said so in the arbitrator's award, 68%, two-thirds of arbitrators, did not use that structure. That tells us the overwhelming number of arbitrators are rejecting the structure of the seven tests. As advocates, you're probably extremely interested in the question of whether it makes a difference. Is it good for me or bad for me as an advocate um, to rely on the seven tests? I suppose the good news from our study is that it doesn't make any difference at all <laughs> um, or in the overall numbers. I'll show you one place where it might make a difference. Let's first focus on the numbers in the, the bottom row um, in black, all cases. Um, these are uh, the general outcomes in all of the cases that we study. Um, that is, 
In half the cases, uh, arbitrators upheld in full the discipline or discharge issued by the employer. Um, the remaining half of cases were divided between those in which no just cause was found and the employer was um, uh, reinstated with full back pay. But of the half in which no just cause for the precise discipline issued was found, uh, we find that more in more cases, um, arbitrators reduced discipline rather than uh, reinstating with uh, full back pay. If you look on the red lines and the blue lines above, however, you'll find that there's no statistically significant difference between those cases in which arbitrators used or did not use the seven tests. The ultimate bottom line, the outcome in both instances is, is for statistical purposes, uh, exactly the same. I mentioned that there was one place where use of the seven tests um, was um, uh, correlated with one aspect of outcomes, and that had to do with uh, procedural uh, defects. Um, one of the criticisms of the seven tests um, is that it encourages arbitrators to overturn discipline for procedural defects regardless of whether it actually had an effect on the ultimate uh, decision. What we do find in this slide um, is a correlation between the arbitrator's use of the seven tests and the likelihood of uh, reducing discipline based on a procedural defect. That is, um, in cases where arbitrators use the seven tests, 16% of those cases were ones in which a procedural defect was relied upon to lessen or reverse uh, discipline. Um, whereas in cases where arbitrators didn't cite the seven tests, um, that reliance on a procedural defect occurred in, over, in only 9% of cases. The problem with this correlation um, is that it's only a correlation. It's not a cause and effect. Um, that is, it might be the case that arbitrators using the seven tests are more likely to find a procedural defect or it may be that arbitrators who find a procedural defect are more likely to cite the seven tests as a rationale for why discipline is being overturned. We can't answer the cause and effect issue. We can only uh, point out uh, the correlation. Well, who are the arbitrators who are relying on the seven tests and who are the ones uh, who are not? Um, the uh, National Academy was very helpful to us in giving information to us about all 81 of our arbitrators. We asked them, has this arbitrator uh, been, uh, uh, become a member of the National Academy of Arbitrators, and if so, in what year? Um, during the period of the study, uh, at a minimum, an applicant for admission to the academy had to have issued 50 awards um, in five years. There's further inquiry into what those awards are, um, and uh, the Academy looks for substantial arbitration experience and broad acceptability. But, it, but we're thinking here that National Academy membership was essentially a proxy for experience. So the question was, do more experienced arbitrators use the seven tests? Do less experienced arbitrators use the seven tests? And we, because we knew the year in which an arbitrator <coughs> became a member, we could say that in the year before membership, we code that as a non-member. In the year of or after membership, we coded it as an academy member. And what do we see here? Um, Non-academy members are significantly more likely to rely on the seven tests than academy members. Indeed, non-members are more than three times more likely to rely on the seven tests than academy members, although in both instances, the numbers are small. That is, only 3% of awards of academy members relied on the seven tests and 10% of awards of non-academy members. Uh, a similar analysis was done with regard to the extent to which the arbitrator was active as an arbitrator. I think we all know that there are some arbitrators that are busier than they want to be, and there are many arbitrators who yearn for uh, larger caseloads. Um, we were able to compare within the database those arbitrators who had 50 or more cases in our database and those arbitrators who had uh, fewer awards. Uh, the findings here 
um, are looking at that correlation between caseload size and use of the seven tests. And we have a finding here very similar to the National Academy inquiry, which tells us um, that uh, the more prolific arbitrators are the ones who are less likely to be relying on the seven tests. Another inquiry had to do <coughs> with whether the arbitrator who issued the award was an attorney. We wondered whether lawyers or non-lawyers as arbitrators were more or less likely to rely on the seven tests. Um, we obtained the biographical statement of all of the 81 arbitrators to check who had a JD degree and who did not, and here we found no statistically significant relationship between attorney status um, and uh, use of the seven tests. So here are, are some conclusions that we can draw from this examination. The first is, I, I think, a very um, surprising one, that despite the salience in the literature of the seven tests, arbitrators in practice are quite infrequently relying on the seven tests, and as far as we can tell, the arguments relying on the seven tests are much less frequently made by advocates. Two-thirds of the arbitrators in our database never, in any of their awards, cited the seven tests. Um, citing the seven tests did not have a demonstrable effect on the outcome of cases. And finally, more experienced and more prolific arbitrators were significantly less likely to rely on the seven tests. Um, for more information on the study, you can uh, take, take a look at the book. Some of my favorite charts in the book uh, are ones that code 43 different offenses um, and tell you uh, what is the likelihood in a discipline case versus a discharge case of um, uh, the a discipline being upheld, overturned, or uh, resulting in a split decision. We compare public and private sector decisions. We uh, do a whole bunch of gender analyses about does it matter if the grievant is a woman and the arbitrator is a woman, and the short answer is gender washes out completely. It doesn't seem to make much of a difference except in one little narrow discipline category. Uh, but um, I, I, I don't, I think if I were to enter the debate about uh, which side I was on, I, I would side uh, with, with Dan and, and, and Margie, uh, but I'm here just to speak to what arbitrators do, and I think the empirical answer is um, that there is very little reliance in the decision of arbitrators on the seven tests, and that the most experienced ones are least likely to rely on the seven tests. Thank you, Laura. That's, that's really fascinating stuff, and I know um, uh, th there's a lot more research in that book that, that's very eye-opening and, and I think very helpful. Um, I did, by the way, it's occurred to me during this talk that I, I wanted to clarify and, and, and apologize uh, to those in the room. Um, at the beginning, I, I was singing the praises of this, uh, of this group. Um, who now, it will now be obvious that they deserved it. Um, um, and I referred to them as some of the greatest minds in the top. Um, I did want to recognize that there are uh, two things. One is there are um, some NAA arbitrators <laughs> in the room. But they're not and, as smart and, as they and, are. Well, uh, well they, are, they themselves are among the greatest minds. Just ask them. <laughs> um, they don't have books to sell, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, the other thing is uh, I'm sure that uh, there are members of our roster in the room who are not NAA arbitrators who are really excellent. We really do have uh, some very excellent arbitrators um, on our roster who have, you know, just don't have the huge quantities of experience um, that is uh, a main requirement for being on the NAA. But in any case, um, I think it's time, unless anybody wanted to add some remarks or Floyd a rebuttal to the research. Yeah, I just have one uh, remark. I hope you listen closely with regards to the terminology. See, I think it's a, a matter of semantics. Uh, is it elements or is it tests? Uh, if you say, are they using the tests? We say, no, they're not. But if they're using the elements, yes, they are. And if you actually look at the elements, they're the same as the tests. Uh, 
Uh, so, uh, so think about that. You know, when folks are saying uh, that no one, are, uh, that pro uh, that the senior folks are not using, uh, you know, the tests. I think they really are. They're just calling it the, you know, the elements uh, that are there. And also, you know, with the uh, National Academy folks who are uh, with a lot of experience and many years of experience, uh, that I, I sense that they may be sometimes less structured with regards to a roadmap to say, okay, this is the roadmap you've got to go through, uh, is that they like that discretion to be able to make those kind of judgments, and so therefore they may not use that format, but they are using the elements, you know, that are there. There's a couple of us roaming around the room with microphones, so if you have a question, if yeah. you just raise your question, hand. Question, comment, and then we're gonna ask if you, you want to stand up. If so. you uh, if you want to get tangled up, yes. I'm one of those academy arbitrators, that, <laughs> not of the stature. Very of the smart. <laughs> <than I am. laughs> uh, before I became an arbitrator in 1989, I was labor counsel for a class one railroad for a dozen years. So in addition to arbitrating over a thousand railroad cases, I also argued over a thousand railroad cases. And, and it is correct that Carol Daugherty came up with the tests in Chicago, but he did it at the National Railroad Adjustment mm -hmm. Board and there were 11 tests. <laughs> uh, Dan is absolutely correct in saying that this is part of the collective bargaining agreements in the railroad industry. Every one of them refers to an investigation, and they use that word, uh, which is where Daugherty picked it up. And it is a requirement that has been in existence for, at this point, approximately 100 years since the, the government took over the railroads. One thing that Dan didn't mention is that there's another factor uh, that distinguishes railroad arbitration from most other arbitration, and that's the requirement in all of the agreements setting up these boards and the rules of the National Railroad Adjustment Board is that the record is closed on the property. Their parties are not permitted to introduce any new evidence or any, make any new arguments at arbitration. So we have to look at the transcript of that investigation, and that's all we can look at. Uh, when I conduct a de novo arbitration hearing, I am the fact finder, and it's my responsibility to conduct the fair and impartial investigation or to ensure that it's fair and impartial. Uh, in most cases, there's no proscription against the parties introducing new evidence at the de novo arbitration hearing. And I've had cases where the employee was never consulted never interviewed before he was dismissed. And the true story first comes out before me as the arbitrator. And I have looked at that story and believed that story, uh, and there was really nothing to contradict it, and have overturned the discipline. Shame on the employer for not conducting an investigation or whatever you want to call it, and could have found out that information but there's nothing to prohibit me, uh, in most cases, from considering that. George, let's see if we can find an advocate out there. Oh, no. Uh, I'm a mediator, but that's yes, supposed to yeah, be that, an advocate. That, that's, that's, that's. Uh, the, my question I have for, the, for all of you is, if we're only talking about semantics and its elements versus a test, and you believe that the elements outlined in the seven for the uh, test or seven steps of just cause are appropriate, are inappropriate, what additional elements would you as arbitrators utilize to determine whether or not due process was followed in a termination? I heard you say one thing which would be the demeanor or credibility is not outlined in the steps. Is there anything else you would add to the seven steps that you as arbitrators in your practice utilize? So your question went to due process. Did you mean just cause or due process? Just cause. Okay. Just cause, due process, elements when determining appropriateness of the discipline. What, I mean, I think one of the things that Dan talked about, and Floyd views that as incorporated into the seventh question, is mitigating circumstances, aggravating circumstances. Um, I, again, look at the big picture, the culture of the workplace, too. What would be appropriate, for instance, shop talk someplace might not be somewhere else. So those would be other factors, and I rely on the parties 
to educate me as to your culture. Um, and that comes by what has the, who has the employer disciplined in the past? You know, what kind of rules do you have? Are they joint rules? And that would be another very important thing. Are these unilateral work rules under the Management Rights Clause, or are these bilateral rules that the union has bought into? <coughs> Much more powerful. So those are just a couple. I'm sure there are more. I think you can find almost anything you want in the seven tests, OK? As long as you don't teach it or treat them as tests. I, I, I think the reason that those of us who reject the structure of the seven tests is because of its structure. Uh, the notion that all elements need to be uh, investigated in each case and that there is a clear answer um, uh, to each of those questions. I think uh, as a list of considerations, if they're rephrased, um, they're, they're largely appropriate. Uh, some, I, I mean, I would concur with the investigation one uh, being really unnecessary uh, as, as a de novo fact finder. Um, what, what, just, uh, I'm eager to get your question, but just, just one uh, point of, uh, of clarification. Um, now I've lost the thread. What was my point of clarification? <laughs> think, you ask your question and I'll well, think of what I needed to clarify. My, yeah, sorry. Um, we in the federal sector apply the Douglas factors, as I'm sure yes. you know, and in the last year and a half, advocating on behalf of management in the federal sector, and we have just cause in our contract, but I also found myself arguing the Douglas factors, which largely track the seven mm -hmm. tests. They're also applied as elements. Some of them are not applicable, so you pick and choose the ones that the parties think are applicable. So to mm -hmm. me, it's very analogous, and I think it's interesting that they more or less track. And I just wanted to say I did actually lose a case where the agency did not investigate before they issued discipline, they took the word of the uh, you know, management witnesses and didn't talk to anybody else, and we got nailed. And actually, the arbitrator was right, you know, that you should look and see what's the other side of the story before you impose. So I think what uh, Ms. Brogan said about due process being critical, whether you're in the private sector or not. So I think it's all, all of the above, actually. Mm -hmm. let, let me Very good make point. A clarification. Thank you for telling, to reminding us about that, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, when I remembered my point of clarification, um, and that is, um, you, uh, one of you mentioned, I believe it was Dan, um, uh, earlier on, uh, in, in reference to Floyd's reputation, but all of you have enormous reputations. Uh, parties know what they're getting uh, when they select any one of you as an arbitrator. But what about some of our um, newer arbitrators um, on our on our roster, um, and there are always new arbitrators coming along. Um, it takes some time for them to get many cases. Um, but where the parties can't so readily get that by reputation, does Floyd have a point that maybe there should be some sort of default structure, or, or what, what's a party to do? Well, of course, you know, I believe in the structure, and uh, as you know, with regards to the training program at FMCS, uh, that you follow uh, that particular model. Uh, I think it's important for new arbitrators to have a model that's in place, uh, that we shouldn't uh, kind of leave them out there and to say it's your discretion and your judgment, you pick the elements that you think are appropriate. Uh, it seems to me that the, the, the structure helps them as well as you. I mean, I believe in that predictability, and I just believe that the, the test or the use of the elements gives you that predictability. Uh, without it, uh, you leave the arbitrator uh, with an enormous amount of power with regards to how they reach decisions. And I think that arbitrators should have less power there and more narrow power, if you will. And I appreciate what you said with regards to Douglas. For those of us who do federal sector as well, uh, if you look at the Douglas factors, uh, we, we work those elements through every case as it relates to those factors. And it's, it's just very similar. It's just that one's federal and uh, one's private. So I appreciate that uh, as, as well. I, I think there can be real error produced by strict following of the seven tests particularly with regard to the nature of the investigation. There are many instances where an investigation may be inadequate, but the employer is fully able at the time of the hearing to prove that just cause existed. I certainly have seen many decisions of 
uh, usually more junior arbitrators who just say bad investigation, employee gets job back even though there was good evidence supporting the ultimate decision that the employer made. If I could just comment, um, the wonderful Barry Winograd and I <laughs> taught the FMCS Institute becoming a labor arbitrator for 12 years. And one of the things that we both stressed was when you're a newer arbitrator and these hard questions come before you, find people to talk to about it, remember the answer that question, remember that you are going to be selected in the future as your answer to that question the first time it's asked of you. Um, because your decision may be out there, people may speak about it, and you build the reputation from your very first decision. So I say that, you know, I think people are very savvy, advocates are very savvy about finding out about us, and they find out about us from word of mouth. But um, think about that first time you're asked, you know, should the grievant be the first witness? Um, think about how you're going to answer that, right, right or wrong and know that parties will select you in the future based upon that. And I want to shout out to some of my students who are in our last class. <laughs> I see them. Um, great course, and I'm glad the FMCS is continuing it. Yes. Oh, but speaking of the class, uh, <laughs> one time uh, uh, Floyd and uh, Marty Malin, who was sitting in the back there, uh, were, were co-trainers. And uh, they had a great back and forth about the seven tests, and it made it was just so valuable to uh, to the uh, the budding arbitrators uh, in the class. Go ahead. So we have just cause in our contract, and then we have the seven tests of just cause in our discovery investigatory paperwork that we go through. And um, if a person performs some act of gross misconduct, and essentially the parties agree that it's gross misconduct. However, there's other people in that employee's direct work environment that's doing just as bad things, <laughs> including people in leadership. <laughs> um, does that mitigate it? Uh, you know, one of the tests is, is the rule applied even-handedly? Does it mitigate it when it's gross misconduct? Yeah, whether you're applying seven tests or not, yes. Uh, you know, um, and I think the seven tests expressly ask that, but. Uh, anyone doing a just cause analysis would have to ask that question and, you know, if they're playing favorites, they're playing favorites. <laughs> my, my most extreme example was to overturn the discipline of someone who had pleaded nolo contendere to um, assault. It turned out everybody in the workplace on people's birthday were paddling one another with wooden paddles and they <laughs> had done it for 20 years in sight of supervisors with supervisors participating and taking photographs. <laughs> I, I would suggest to you that you settle the case. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that watching the grievance mediation conducted this morning by Vanessa Bullock, I don't know if any of you saw it, but they had a past practice, there had been this laxity of enforcement. It wasn't gross misconduct, but it was misconduct. And they settled it in that grievance mediation because the employer knew they were in trouble. And then you can say, okay, from now on, we're posting a rule. You can't do this anymore. And then the past practice behind is gone, but I would settle that case if you could. Why don't you call Vanessa? She was very good at <laughs> mediating. But you know, the other point that you raised, if I can say quickly, as you pointed out that you have the handbook and it has the seven elements and just cause and so forth, uh, one of the things I had in my notes that I didn't get to is that the, org the organization, the parties, you can always limit uh, you know, the use of the, of the elements or, or the tests. So there are uh, contracts where, as the arbitrator, I'm informed, okay, uh, if you reach a decision here, then you cannot apply the other element there. Uh, and so for those of you who might have concerns with, with regards to how they're being used, you like some and you don't like some, uh, I've seen those contracts where the parties actually have agreed to reduce the number of the seven uh, and exclude it. Therefore, the arbitrator had no authority to be able to use all seven. The, the other answer to your question is back pay with no reinstatement. Um, my name is Barry Winograd, so I just want to uh, respond to something that, that I've heard. First comment is that people in bargaining agreements agree to use the term just cause, sufficient cause, 
reasonable cause, good cause, and leave it at that, not necessarily without adornment, and without adornment, because they want subjectivity. They do not want rigidity. If you want rigidity, write it into the agreement. Specify standards or elements that have to be considered, any one of which will result in a reversal of discipline if the answer is no. Write it into the agreement. Don't ask us to write it in. Now, this room has a lot of advocates in it. Margie Brogan, in a program that we did at the National Academy of Arbitrators in 2011, which is available for advocacy training, it is the best film I know. It runs about 75 minutes. She plays the grievant, a delivery driver named Billy Smith, who finds $400 in an employee-only restroom on her route. She is fired for dishonesty. Was it theft? Was it just something else? Experienced advocates for labor and management cross-examined her. Five very distinguished arbitrators ruled on it. A six-person system board of adjustment from the airline industry ruled on it. It is a terrific tape. Um, and you will see that I think that just cause is a matter of nuance, characterization, emphasis. It is not a rigid menu or script. And for those of us who do this every day, I think we realize that. And I think that's what I've heard generally in the discussion. You can get that for training, and it's been used by many unions all over the country already. Go uh, to the National Academy of Arbitrators website, naarb.org. Contact our national office. I think it costs 25 bucks. And, it, it will, and you'll see Margie giving an Academy Award uh, uh, presentation. And, uh, full disclosure for those of you who are not aware, <laughs> Barry and Margie are husband and wife. <laughs> Just so, just so you know. And we split the proceeds of everything. <laughs> we have time for a couple of more. Yeah. I am a union representative with the federal government, and we have just cause written into our collective bargaining agreement. However, Ms. Cooper, I found your um, data absolutely astonishing mm -hmm. and very informative about the way that arbitrators look at just cause and how many of them actually cite it. Is there any empirical evidence, or how constrained do arbitrators feel to follow the seven steps of just cause when they're written into a collective bargaining agreement, and the first thing that an advocate says is, it's written into the collective bargaining agreement, this is what we must follow? I think there's no question that if it's in the contract, the arbitrator is going to follow it. Right. I think in, I don't know, 30 years of arbitration, I think I've seen one contract that had that in there. Others may have different experience, but if it's there, I will absolutely follow it, and I imagine others will as but well. If, but if you're in the federal sector, then you've got the Douglas, Douglas factors, factors yeah. apply, and that's by law. So, yeah. yeah, so, and that's why it's there. So, yes, of course, I'm bound to follow that. Uh, I'm one of the FMCS rosters, so I'm not great and wonderful yet, but I'm getting there. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I have been around at least a while, and I've gotten tons of cases where the advocates have provided the seven test criteria, either in the course of the hearing or in their briefs. And my question is kind of for the advocates to some extent, what would you do, because I have done it, uh, if I semi-ignored those and wrote around them in, in other, I've, I followed them and I've not followed them. So I guess I'm one of those that does a little bit of both. But I, I want to know how the advocates feel if I don't directly, uh, you know, attribute their language right back to them. I think advocates want us to respond to the questions uh -huh. they pose. Right. You can't and have your own brand of justice by just ignoring. Yeah. So if they cite it, I think the expectation is that you want to address it. So I, I would, I would find a way to address it. Yes, I, was, I, I would say would that the ar they argued these. What? What did you say? What I said you even mean? I would do that. If oh they my gosh. Me too. So. And one one note, last question, anybody? Here we go, and that and that will be the end. Hi, I'm trying to find out. I'm been listening to your pros and cons. How many points? Because I don't know whether to call them elements or tests at this point. <laughs> how many points would it be 
that somebody would have to prove in order for you to agree that there is no just cause? Could be one. It could be one. It depends yeah. on the case. Mm -hmm. That's the problem with, with characterizing it as a test. You know, at the end, you right. count and up the score. Right, and that's what I'm trying to get over. I'm trying there to understand. No I mean, if you're saying they're not tests and they're elements, well, how many elements does it take mm -hmm. to, to throw out a, a management decision? It's subjective, it's okay? That's, that's sort of the point. You, you can't have seven tests that are going to uh, take a subjective process and turn it into science. It just, it's not science. Um, you know, there's a lot of judgment involved. Just cause is a term of art. Take, take an element like equal treatment. Well, you're supposed to treat like cases alike, but to take into account individual factors. That's not one test. Um, it's not one question. It's a number of factors that have to be evaluated in the context of the particular case and the particular workplace. Just in the name of uh, doing no harm. Um, I don't want people to walk out of here with the impression that you can ignore due process <laughs> in your uh, disciplinary procedure and that that's okay. Okay, if, if I suggested that earlier, I completely misspoke on that. But I was saying that I didn't care whether you had a fair and impartial judge down there. It depends what the evidence is that comes in front of me. But if you don't give someone an opportunity to be heard, you've got a problem, all right? Unless, as in the case of the foreman in Grief Brothers Cooperage, you're the one who witnessed it. You know, having, at that point, I think, uh, an investigation is probably a mistake and not a violation of due process, all right? But, anyway. I want to thank the four of you. You're a terrific panel. You lived up to the great expectations that I um, that I set at the beginning, and really on behalf of FMCS and everybody here, thank you very much. Thank you.